Well, good morning. So good to see you. It's been a wonderful, wonderful time together. I um, just been so blessed by the conversations, by the times that we've spent and learning together, growing together, and just being reunited. It's just been a special time, hasn't it? Can we give our Lord Jesus a round of applause? I wanted to start out this morning and just summarize uh, a few of the things that I've heard, and maybe you've heard these things as well. I know some of you weren't here on Thursday, but I just want to go through a few highlights real quick. On Thursday, I had the chance to share with you uh, going through the who, the why, the what's, and the hows of our vision and our desire for us as Grace Communion International here in Canada and around the world to be the healthiest expression of the church of Jesus Christ that we can possibly be. And that's, that's an ongoing vision. That's, that's not necessarily a destination, is it? It's not going to be like, oh, we have arrived. I don't think that will quite be the case because we'll continue to monitor the health of our church. We'll continue to grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. But that's the vision of pursuing being the best church that we can be in representing Jesus Christ. So we shared that. Mike Rasmussen got up and he really went through the house of we become sharper and better and, and better focused on how we participate with Jesus through the avenues of faith, hope, and love. And I'm going to come back and revisit that a little bit today in the sermon. So Mike, he gave us the overall concepts and helped us to see an overview, which I think was really, really helpful. Friday and Saturday, we were blessed with Steve Bell to be here, inspiring us not only with his music, his stories, and his teaching, but just his presence. So thank you, Steve. Yeah, you can clap. <laughs> I, um, I especially appreciated his explanation of Isaiah 6 and talking about the layers and the textures of worship. And isn't that so much a part of what the Hope Avenue is for us as well? To be able to think about that. I, I, I hate to say it, but I, I believe through all that we've gone through, even in the last 25, 30 years, we, we've, been, we've been a little bit tired, haven't we? And then we capped that off with COVID, and, and that can be even somewhat more discouraging. But I, I think this conference has been a conference of renewed hope. And the Hope Avenue is really where we start. And I think when you go back home, if you didn't get this, if you didn't get this work manual, this handout on, on the Hope Avenue, uh, make sure that you get this. Bill can make sure that you get a copy of this. This is what you can take to start working when you get back home with your worship team, your Hope Avenue team, that you can just work through this and you can do it at your pace. Let's not try to get in front of the Holy Spirit. Let's let the Holy Spirit be out in front of us. Amen. <laughs> and um, so, so actually yesterday, Bill told us in, in the closing of the conference, he wants us to have a pioneer spirit. He wants us to roll up our sleeves and, and go back home and, and, and really think about being the church in the best way that we can be. And I, I believe through COVID, yes, COVID was a time that we had you know, a, a lot of time to just sit and reflect. We we dealt with some loss. A lot of people dealt with even going through the sickness. I had COVID twice. I don't know, you know, and, and again, it was my weight loss program. I don't, it's not the one of choice, but uh, after this conference, I may need to go home and uh, and fast for a week as well, because we, we ate so much. I'm going to remember the food too. Aren't you going to remember the food? Yeah. We have been served not only physical food, but I think more importantly, we've been served spiritual food. The um, coming out of COVID is actually an opportunity as well, isn't it? It's not, it's not just been a challenge to regather, but it's an opportunity. We get a fresh start. I know when we sing the songs that God makes his mercies new every day, and he does make his mercies new every day. But I think through coming through the season that we have, and now we're regathering, some of you are looking for church halls to meet in, but you're also looking for neighborhoods where you can share the love of Jesus, the overflow of his love through you, that you can share that with your neighbors and the good news that guess what? 
God is not counting your sins against you. He's taken care of that in Jesus. Hallelujah. <laughs> That's some good news, isn't it? That's some really good news. Well, today, what I want to do, um, Bill and I talked about this. I, I normally preach when I'm uh, on the road like this. I normally stick with the RCL because you know what? It works. <laughs> Um, God knows in the timing of the year what works, but Bill and I talked a little bit about this, and I'm, I'm, going, I'm going off the page a little bit, and I'm going to give a sermon called Jesus, Our One True Foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3, you can turn there with me if you would like. I want to read to you verses 10 through 15. I'm going to, I'm going to be real modern like Bill and read off of my phone. How about that? So, this is the writing of Paul. It says, according to the grace of God given to me. Have you received grace as well? So, according to the grace of God given to us, let us, like a skilled master builder, he says, I laid a foundation and another man is building upon it. Let's each take care of how we build. How is it that Paul is a skilled builder, you know? I don't think he worked in construction, but he's talking about building the church here. He's not talking about a building per se. And it's true with you and me. The work we're doing is continuing to build and grow the church. And the fact that he's a skilled master builder seems kind of ironic. You know, he, he knew how to make tents. I wouldn't say that tents were structures and buildings, you know, they were temporary uh, shelters, but he, um, he said he's a skilled master builder. It's really a little bit easier for him to say that about himself. But the reason he's a skilled master builder is because he's building on the right foundation. The key to which, which is Christ, the only true foundation. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with Old to stones, wood, each work will become next. We'll disclose it. We'll be built with fire, and the fire will test sort of work each one and one. If the work man has built a foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If man's work is brought, he will suffer loss, though he building with. Uh, so don't get too hung up on that and try to, you know, evaluate that too much. He basically was saying that simply there are things that will last and there will things that will be burned up. That's really what he's saying when he talks about these different materials. And, and for us, how, how are we building? Are we truly building as skilled master builders because we're building upon Jesus and we're flowing from him and through his ministry? Or are we out doing a lot of stuff and a lot of activity that may be equated to wood and straw and hay? I have to confess, and we talked about that yesterday too, that actually confession is part of worship, isn't it? And I have to confess, I've done a lot of busy activity in my years in church leadership and a lot of stuff that really wasn't necessarily in line with the priorities of Jesus. A lot of things that, you know, may have felt good to me or seemed right to me at the time, but I, I, I know that I have. I know there's been times I've not represented Christ as much as I should. I know there's times that probably I haven't given him the glory and, 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 and just shared the good news about him when I've had opportunity to. And I, I think we all could confess and admit we, we, we could, have, could have done that a little bit better, right? <laughs> but the good news in this, too, is he's telling us our salvation is not related to our works. Please understand that, brothers. We are recipients of grace. We are saved by grace alone through Jesus Christ. It's not about our works for salvation. We're not trying to impress God. We're not trying to earn something by our works. But we are trying to be who we are in Christ through the way that we listen to the Spirit in the way we spend our time, our talents, and our treasures, that we want to be in line with what Jesus is doing. Don't we pray every day, thy will be done? 
I find myself praying a lot of times, you know, God, this is what I want to do. Please bless it. <laughs> right? Yeah, I got some really good ideas, God. If you could just get behind those, you know, be a good day for me. <laughs> But I think we can just join together in a corporate prayer and just, you know, talk honestly to our great God. Like Steve talked about that, just being honest before God, just being truthful and like Isaiah was in Isaiah 6. So let's take a moment and just pray together. I'll, I'll let you pray silently and then I'll, I'll pray for us. So let's just bow our heads. Father God, as your people, as your beloved children, we have been gathered here for the last few days, and you have met us uh, with such abundance. You've made your, yourself visible to us. We thank you, Jesus, for just how you are moving in our church. We thank you for the grace that we have received. We, we will never get over that. Help us to always remember and be reminded of what you've done in us and through our body, our little church called Grace Communion International. But Lord, we do confess this morning that there's times that we've been distracted. There's times that we spin our wheels and we do all kinds of things that are not necessarily really the work of Jesus Christ. There's times that we, you know, just follow our will and don't submit to your will. Help us to quiet our spirit. Help us to reflect on who you as we start each day. Help us to, to see you through the day. And even there's times in our life. You make corrections for us. You help get us back on track. Holy Spirit, ways that always rise under with mystery, with miracle. Lord, help us to see those things. I will draw all the world. I don't, I don't always see what you're doing and how you're doing it. But I pray that you would open our eyes, that we could not only see, but that we could join in, that we could align our time and our energy and our focus with your purpose, and that we really would be the best expression of your church that we could possibly be. So, Lord, help us as we pursue you. In our pursuit of you, we become a healthy church. So, Lord, again, we just ask that you forgive us for the times where we just are either lazy, distracted, or just doing our own thing, Lord. We just pray that you would, um, you know, burn that away, but then come behind us and help us to build the precious stones and the metal and the things going to last. Because, Lord, from what Paul said, things that are going to be done through the, the work of your church in all ages, things that will echo into eternity. Lord, those are the things that we want to be a part of. So guide us to that by your power and your will. And we pray it in your powerful name, Lord. Amen. Well, this passage, like I said, it, it really speaks to us in, um, in, in many, many ways. And, um, I, I think we all have that same spirit as, as Paul does. We really want to join in and we want to build on the true foundation. We want to participate with Jesus. I wanted to show you something too, because we've talked about the faith, hope, and love. And typically when you, you hear about faith, hope, and love, what, where does your mind go in scripture? First Corinthians 13, give that man a prize. Yes. And it's so often, I mean, I've done lots of weddings for lots of people. I haven't done as many as Robert McKinney. He, he holds the record, I think. But, but, um, but, but the reality is oftentimes we go to that passage at a wedding ceremony, don't we? And we read through that. And I'll have people, a lot of times people, you know, mostly people not familiar with the Bible, non-Christians, and they'll say, was that Shakespeare? <laughs> say. No, it was actually better. It was the Apostle Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit. How about that? You know, but we we haven't just hijacked 1 Corinthians 13 and tried to, you know, somehow artificially place that on the ministry of Jesus. If, if, if you start looking in scripture, it's just amazing how these 
top virtues, you know, like it says in 1 Corinthians 13, these are the things that will remain. And the greatest of these is what? Is love. That's what changes things. The love of Jesus, the overflow of the love of Jesus in our lives. That's what changes things. I've experienced the overflow these last few days, haven't you? So the overflow of the love of God, that's changes things. So let's see. Uh, I want to read to you. Does anybody know the Great Commission and where it's found? Because <clears throat> we joined Jesus in the Great Commission. I think that's Matthew 28, isn't it? Somewhere in that. Go to the past. Stuck in the Old Testament. Look at that. Bear with me. There it is, Matthew 28. I'd like to read this to you, and then I want to unpack it just a little bit. Hey, hey an advertisement came up. What do you know? I, I'm, I, I'm actually there now. And it says in verse 16, the 11 disciples went to Galilee. We know it's 11 because Judas is no longer with us. But the 11 disciples, they went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. He told them to go there and he would meet them there. It says, when they saw him, when they saw him, they worshiped him. But some doubted, or like another version says, some held back. Some of them weren't swaying their hips that day, Steve, you know. Some doubted. But that didn't slow Jesus down. Jesus wasn't, you know, that's, that's really the cool thing about Jesus, too. Whether we're responding or whether we're resisting, Jesus is still Jesus, and he goes right ahead. And so he does here. Jesus came to them, and he said this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always to the close of the age. Let's flip to the next uh, slide, if you would, Devin. I know it's a little bit difficult to um, to see the small words up there. I, I know on the back of your uh, your uh, name tags, too, they put a schedule that nobody could read. Is that right? That was a really clever joke, Bill. Where are you, Bill? <laughs> it was... It was a nice idea. Somebody said, what you do is you take out the, your camera on, on your phone, you take a picture, and then you blow it up. That's, the, that's how you know what's going on. So I, I think on this one, we kind of got to blow it up too. But, you know, the Hope Avenue shows up right at the start of this, because when Jesus came, what is our response when we see Jesus? You know, what's that going to be like? It's not like, hey, what's up, dude? No, we worship. We worship, you know, that great song that was done by Mercy Me back in the 90s, you know, you know what will I do? You know, will I, will I be able to stand still? Will I fall to my face? What will I do? You know, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. But when he showed up, they worshiped him. I mean, this is the resurrected Jesus for crying out loud, you know. So they worship. Isn't that where it begins with us too? That's where the Hope Avenue starts. It starts with worshiping Jesus. And he tells us, you know, that we are to go and make more disciples. You know, what, what we have, what we've experienced in him, it's not just for us. It's to overflow from us. We're the one organization that doesn't exist for us. We exist for those out there. Isn't that amazing to think of the church in that way, that we really exist for those out there? And we need to live into that. That is the love avenue. That is the love avenue where we reach out and we share. We open our lives. Is it scary to go out? No? Yes? For some of you who just love people and, you know, you just dive right in, you're kind of in your swimming in your water, aren't you? 
And for others of us, it's like, I'm just scared to death of getting to know my neighbor. I guarantee you get to know your neighbors and you're going to find out he got so much in common. So much in common. They love their children and grandchildren just like you do. Did you know that? They have struggles just like you have struggles. I'll tell you a little bit about my neighborhood, okay? We've got an interesting neighborhood. We are in a, a little, a little uh, community on a cul-de-sac. And um, one of my neighbors, I'll tell you about Tom. Tom actually is Jewish. He's not a practicing Jew. He's from New Jersey. And people from New Jersey kind of have a reputation. And because um, he always knows a guy, he tells me I know a guy, which makes me wonder if those guys are in the mafia or not. But I know a guy. And um, and Tom is an airline pilot uh, for American Airlines. And all during COVID, he's wanting to like, just buy me out. I'm so ready to retire, you know. But Tom was one of those guys during COVID. We used to have block parties in our neighborhood. We called them driveway parties because we were distancing. But we would come out on Saturday night about 7 o'clock, and we'd set up our little tables, and Susan and I'd have our snacks and drinks, and Shirley and Skip and Darren and Melissa. That's kind of where it started with those, those three couples. You know, a couple of weeks in, the whole neighborhood was having driveway parties, you know. And I will be honest, we would slip across and share some drinks with people once in a while. And we all stayed healthy. We all stayed healthy. But Tom and Julie, because I'm talking about Tom, they would drive around in their golf cart and they would they would drive up to the gathering. And Julie, who's from North Dakota, you betcha, you know, she uh, she's a godsend to my wife because my wife's from North Dakota and there's. I think they're the only two North Dakotans in all of North Carolina, you know? And they love to drink coffee and talk about North Dakota and their families. And I, I'm glad that Julie's there. Well, Julie's outgoing. She doesn't hear too well. And she doesn't mind saying, can you say that again? You know? And, uh, but Tom, Tom would sit in the golf cart and Tom was just like a stone. Not saying a word. He would last five minutes in the golf cart. And then he would get up and walk back to his house because he wasn't comfortable in the social setting. And um, move, move the story further ahead. Um, Tom started to warm up a little bit, and I kind of wondered why he was so standoffish. I thought, well, this is just him. This is his personality. But it's amazing how over time, Tom just kind of started gathering in. We had a retirement party for Skip next door, and, and he came up there, and uh, he brought a six-pack of Guinness. He's a Guinness drinker, and that was well-received. We enjoyed that, too, you know? And he finally, he kind of started talking and opening up a little bit, and he felt comfortable with Skip and with me, and that was kind of the icebreaker that got Tom going. And a little bit later on, because um, we got closer to Christmas, and Tom and Julie said, we want to do a drop-in at our house. And they had little gift bags for everybody. And it was the funniest thing, because, you know, on the, on the, uh, the airplanes, you get if you have a, an adult beverage, they bring out the little minis. They, they gave us gift bags with a bunch of little minis in it. I said, I said Tom, did those come from the plane? <laughs> And, and no, they didn't. They didn't come from the plane. Tom's a man of integrity. But this is the developing relationship I have with Tom. And Tom told me, he said, well, other neighbors told us that you're like a church guy. You know, this is Tom's language. You're like this church guy, maybe even a little bit like the Pope. He says, but I don't experience you like that. I said, well, good. Well, good, because that's not who I am. I am a church guy, but yeah, not, not quite like the Pope. And Tom and I are working on a project. My, um, I've, I've told you that I, my family's had an apple orchard. I grew up as in a farm family, farming apples and 
um, the, the big standard trees are not the thing anymore. It's these uh, trellis type trees. Orchards now look a little bit more like vineyards than they do orchards. And so we just, uh, in a, in last year or so, we just took down the big trees and we're not going to have any more big trees. So I went in there with a chainsaw and I cut up about six trunks of apple trees and took it to the, um, to the mill because I wanted to do something with the apple wood. I want to make some benches out of this apple wood. And I'm not a woodworker. I, 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 I've, I've got some of the tools, but you got to have the right tools. Anybody a woodworker in here? You know, if you don't have the right tools, it's hard to do the job. You need table saws. You need the, you know, the radial saws. You need, you know, the files and the sanders and all the stuff. You need all the stuff. Well, I was about to make a mess of this. And Tom saw what there and says, hey, 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 Greg, I got the tools. Why don't you bring that stuff down to my house, you know? And this is where we are in relationship. Uh, I Is he coming to our church? No, not presently. It is, is the love of Christ flowing through me to Tom? I'm experiencing the love of Christ through Tom as well. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? And I'm not setting myself, I'm, you know, I'm on a stool here. This is not an ivory tower, okay? <laughs> I'm, I'm learning, too, about how to be a better neighbor. I'm learning, too, about the love avenue and how to reach out. So I just share that personal example to say, you, you can do it. You can do it. Pray about it. You know, I pray for my neighbors in ways that I never have before. It has to start with their heart being broken for other people, doesn't it? It really does. I, I, Tom's not a project. Tom's a friend. So we have to we have to look at it in this way. This is this is the love avenue. Going out and making disciples. We can do this. Then the faith avenue. Teaching them all things, all things, not just some of them. Teach them all things. Not all at once, however, you know, <laughs> you know, go slowly with people, just like relationships take time. Let's be patient. You know, the most beautiful thing about this passage of the Great Commission? Jesus. That's the greatest thing about this passage. And guess what? He's the bookends to this passage, isn't he? All authority has been given to him. So when we go out, we go under his authority. Did you know that? And then he tells us, you don't go alone. We never go alone because he is with us. He is with us always, even till the ends of the age. Hallelujah. <laughs> so again, this is participation with him. This is not going out and doing ministry for him. It's doing it with him. And he will lead you and he will be faithful. Let's go to Acts chapter 2. Hold on. You can, you can move to the next slide if you would. I think my phone's going to cooperate this time. It would be really good if it does. Uh, we know Acts 2. We read in the day of Pentecost. We read about the, uh-oh, uh I'm getting all kinds of stuff coming up. Whoa, stop it. Really? I haven't seen one of them. A real Bible. Wow. I'm going to use my electronic Bible, I think. No, here we go. Hey, look at that. You can hold it. You can see it. You can touch it. It's all about the senses. Here we go. In Acts chapter 2, we know the day of Pentecost. We know about the Holy Spirit coming. We know about the miracles that happened. We know about the baptisms, and the beginning of the church. But this is probably the most, I would say, the, the, the best description of a healthy church is the beginning of the church and what the church in Jerusalem was like. Isn't it interesting how the very beginning is what we have to kind of look back to to say that's what we want to be now? <laughs> but here's, here's what they say about this new church that came out of this amazing day of Pentecost. 
Verse 42, Acts 2, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every, every day, every day, not every Sunday, but every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And notice this. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. God's the one who gives the growth. And I think we all know that and we're aware of that. The things we've been talking about are not church growth strategies, okay? I know it can easily look that way and think that way, but the people like Tom in my life and the Toms and the Bettys and the Julies in your life, they are people that are beloved children of God. They're not projects. Anytime we start trying to engage yourself in ministry and we look at it as a project, you know, that's going to be straw and hay and stubble and it's going to burn up. It's just going to burn up. It's not going to last. But here in Acts 2, if you can go to the next slide, Debbie, here in Acts 2, we see it drawn out. Faith, hope, and love shows up again. And, you know, I, I have to, to let you know that when I started seeing these things showing up, and I, I'm seeing faith, hope, and love showing up in the writings of Paul all over the place. But you know where I first started seeing it here in the Great Commission and first started seeing it here in the life of the New Testament church? Our regional director in South Africa was the one saying, hey, look at this, Greg. It's here. It's here. It's Takalani Musaik was the one who showed me this. And I give him the credit for that because guess what? The body works together. I may be the president, but I don't have all the answers. I got a lot of questions, <laughs> but I don't have all the answers. But as a body and we come together and Takalani was showing me all of this and we know the hope avenues in there. It's interesting. We talk about, you know, breaking bread together. It, it, it talks about that twice in the passage because in the passage we're going to share bread and wine together as well. The Lord's supper there, but he emphasizes they shared the Lord's supper and they also shared meals together in their homes too. I hope we're hospitable like that. I hope we have people in our homes. I hope we do that. It's not as much of a thing now as it used to be. People like to privatize what they're doing. I know in the U.S., we don't really sit down and, and enjoy a meal. We kind of devour the food because we're busy people and we've got to get on to the next thing. But there's something about sharing a long and lingering meal together that there's just joy in that. You guys remember Joe Dukach. Joe would just tell you, he says, eating together is a spiritual activity. And he, he makes it that way. If you've ever had a meal with Joe, he makes it that way. We linger over the good food and the good fellowship. And we meet Jesus in that way. So we see the Hope Avenue there. We also see that they were out in the temple courts. They weren't just in their homes, privatized and hiding out in their homes. They were out in public. Paul goes on to talk about how that he was in the marketplace daily, meeting people, talking with people, building relationships. That's what the Love Avenue is about, getting out, getting out, meeting people, establishing relationships. Well, the New Testament church was doing that. And they were growing in faith attending to the apostles' teachings. Remember how the story unfolds in Acts? By Acts chapter 7, they end up saying that, you know, the apostles are, you know, having to wait on tables. They're being occupied with physical tasks, and they shouldn't have to do that. And so they, what did they do? They recognized and ordained deacons, didn't they? And they started giving out other responsibilities to other people because it was more important for the apostles to be able to attend to the teachings of Jesus and growing the faith of the people. And we have to give attention to that. I 
I, uh, you know, we're talking about confession earlier, even when I was pastoring, I, I used to think, oh, well, people are being discipled through my sermons. <laughs> but no, they weren't, especially the ones who were sleeping, they weren't being discipled at all. <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but the reality, being up here preaching is, is not about discipling. This is about pointing people to Jesus. This is about hopefully being inspired. And when we gather for worship service, that's really what it's about. But we also need other opportunities, too, where we do dig into the Word of God together, where seasoned believers are helping the new believers along. We, we need to have those times of gathering as well. But for all you pastors, you know, I, to me, preaching is really about pointing people to Jesus and hopefully inspiring people you know, when they go out, they they felt like, you know, I, I met Jesus. I, I felt the power of the Spirit in what we did here today. And I know we don't hit home runs every time. You know, some of the sermons, though, that I felt like fell the flattest, and I, I was disappointed in that. That's when people came up and said, wow, you know, you really helped me today. <laughs> in our weakness is where we're made strong, right? So who's the hero of your sermon? <laughs> That's a good question for, for preachers. Who's the hero of your sermon? Is it you or is it Jesus? So let's make sure that we're, we're pointing people to Jesus. This is what Paul was talking about in being a skilled master builder. Are we, are we keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus? Are we always pointing people to Jesus? And the work that we're doing, are we doing it with him and building out from him? Is that what we're doing? Because this is what it's about. That diagram that keeps showing up, people look at that and they kind of wonder what in the world is that and why the circles and why all of the things going around. The truth of the matter is, if you, if you start unpacking that, that gold center piece it says Jesus, the great shepherd, because he is the foundation. He is the center of the center. We don't make him the center. He is the center. And as pastors and leaders, the pastor is an under shepherd working through the power and the presence of Jesus. Okay. And out from that, we show the avenues, the love, the hope, and faith avenues. And those ministries to be directed and guided through the power of the Holy Spirit. And those ministries don't work in isolation. Yes, there's a sense in each of those areas, but they will lap, they will innovate. And that's partly the pastor's role to make sure those ministries are operating effectively and healthy and we're paying attention to who it. But the beauty of all of this is the faith, hope, and love that we have is the faith, hope, and love of Jesus. It's who he is. It's his nature and personhood. And if this is who he is, and these are the best words we have from Jesus, out of the overflow of the faith, hope, and love that now I can be a skilled builder and now I can join him in what he's doing. This is what participation looks like. It starts with Jesus and it flows through us. And I'll tell you, just as individuals, let's please think this individually. Let's think corporately. We do belong to one another. And we, when we do things together corporately, we're so much more together. Your presence in my life matters. And I hope my presence in your life matters too. Because we're the church. On Thursday, we, we declared that we are church people. Not the Pope, but we are church people, okay? 
So that's what that's what this diagram is about. And the outer ring says all to the glory of God and to the building of his kingdom, because that's that's what what this is about. There's like a calendar in the background, because guess what? Ministry happens in time and space, doesn't it? So we have to think about the rhythms of how these things work and how they flow together in the life of our church. I, I don't think this one shows it, but there's a little piggy bank down on the uh, kind of in the background too, because it actually takes money and budget, you know, to do ministry. So we have to think about those things. There's some real practical aspects to ministry too, but we're going to continue to go in this direction. This is not like, oh, well, that was a neat idea. We saw that in 2022 and then never came up again. No, you know, we have a three-year plan. You know, we're committed to this. We're long-term in this. You know, Mike is the uh, superintendent for North America. He's going to make himself available as needed. And we're going to continue to unpack these things. We're going to continue to learn. But this is the foundation of where we are, because guess what? The foundation is who? <laughs> it's Jesus. The foundation is not a what. It's not a bunch of concrete and, and, and uh, rebar. It's Jesus himself is the true foundation. So what I'd like for us to do as we think about Jesus, I'll give you a, a minute to try to start unpackaging this little thing. I, I, I just want to say, be careful. I, uh, I cheated. I started unpacking mine before the service. Um, these convenient but they're also really tricky, okay? So, yeah, the bread on the top, and then don't spill the juice as you're getting the bread out. Once you have retrieved the body of Jesus, okay, I'd like for you to hold it up and present it. Yeah, it is going to take a while, okay? You know, Deb gave us it on Thursday when we opened up, and she said he came with it. We were right, Debbie. So I remember these things. And I, I just want to say what joy it is to participate with Jesus. What joy it is for us to take his body and his blood into our lives and to truly commune with him. So brothers and sisters, this is the body of Jesus. Take and eat. Once again, hold it up when you're This is his precious blood that was poured out for you and me. It makes us whole. It makes us righteous. It joins us to him. So the blood of Jesus. Once again, what a privilege. What a privilege it is to be able to take of this very, very simple ceremony, and yet so profound. It helps us to remember the past and who Jesus was and what he's done for us. It helps us think about what he's doing with us now, and it also helps us to think about what's yet to come. How amazing is that? The eternal Jesus in a small little container of grape juice and bread. And we are grace communion. Through his grace, we are brought together, and it's by his grace we're held together, too. So let me just pray a blessing over us. I don't know if there are any other. We're going to have a song from Steve. You, you want to? We'll have a song because we, that's part of the joy, Steve. I, I, I want a song, too, man. So, <laughs> But let me just pray a blessing over us, and I'll have Steve. We'll close with a song, and then you can. Hug necks, pack bags, and go home.
All right. Lord Jesus, thank you. We just rejoice with you. Thank you for meeting us in this place. And we know that when we go out, you're with us always, always, wherever we go, even until the end of the age. You never leave us. You never forsake us. You're in us. You're with us. You're guiding us. You're leading us. You're the head of our church. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you for everything that's happened here over these last few days. Um, we have had hope restored. We have had life restored. We have been rejuvenated. And may we go out and, Lord, join you, even in a, in a better and a more intentional way to join you, to turn our attention to you, to seek your will, to seek your ways, and to be the church that you would have us be. So thank you. We just want to say that we love you, we adore you, we worship you, and we do it all in your name. Amen.